one thing while it's the band you're trying to sit down and have my screen there at the back, please, and front my, my message to come on if I may. Um, we have been looking at the Holy Spirit in the deeper sessions in the evening service. Um, and it has been, in my opinion, one of my best experiences I've had as a preacher and a teacher. Um, because we have learned quite a lot. And we are exploring far much deeper understanding of the Holy Spirit in the evening service. And of course, we've had people have attended, and a lot of us have been unable to attend. Uh, what I will do this morning is what I'll continue to do in the deeper uh, Holy Spirit course. What I'll give you is just a snapshot of what I'll be doing in the evening service because of the constraints of time in the morning. In the evening, we tend to have more time to explore in far much detail what the Holy Spirit is and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all the other ramifications that goes with that. So I would encourage you, if you have never been, to be uh, attending one of those sessions. We have one, Baptism the Holy Spirit, session two, where we're going to look at the other aspect of that uh, particular topic. This morning is Pentecost Sunday. And just before we look at that, I've got a grandson. He's not here this morning. He's in London. He tends to be between London and, and Colchester. Um, he bought um, what do you call a Lego uh, city uh, thing, or Lego city kind of thing to build. Um, and he brought it home to his granddad to kind of have a go at building this thing. So when I looked at it, I thought to myself, hmm, I don't think I'm going to have the time and the energy to do this. <laughs> but my granddaughter was, uh, my, my, my granddaughter, sorry, my grandson was very enthusiastic about it. And he just opened it up and we read through the booklet. And he just looked at the booklet, booklet one, and he opened it and he started building straight away. So in a sense, I looked at the booklet, I looked at the picture, I joined in. I joined in. And this, we've been doing it for the last week, day one, we did one part of the booklet, we built one section. And he was very keen to come back for a second time, because then the following day after school, he dashed to, my, to our place to build a second session uh, of this uh, Lego city. On Thursday, we have about almost finished the whole thing. And we're just about to put the whole thing together so that it looks what it looks like in the picture. Hopefully. Because <laughs> usually what looks in the picture is not the same what is looking at the ground. But one thing which was amazing about this experience is that we both had this vision to build. And we have the knowledge, as we have gone through the booklet, he has the knowledge, I have got the knowledge, he's building his own thing, I'm also building my own thing on the side. But, and this is the key point, the excitement that was in both of our eyes as we were building this thing together, and the love that we shared together in that moment of building this Lego seat together, the joy of experiencing this thing coming together was awesome. I just want you to have that at the back of your mind as we look at today the topic of Pentecost. If I may have a clicker on front, I don't know where it is. I will just invite you, if I may, to turn to the passage before us, the Holy Spirit filled life. And I think I envisioned the Holy Spirit filled life like what I was doing with my grandson. It's a life of joy. It's a life of love. It's a life of passion. And it's a life 
of sharing together your personal experience of what you are doing. That's what it is to have the Holy Spirit filled life as we unlock together these verses. First thing I want to do is to look at what does it mean to have this Holy Spirit filled life? What does it mean? Look at verse 18, if you may. Do not be drunk with wine. I'll talk about that in a minute. The wine drinkers are looking forward to this, aren't they? Some of them are whiskey drinkers, I don't know. But which leads to what? To debauchery or debauchery. But be filled with the Holy Spirit speaking to one another uh, in psalms and hymns. Be filled. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean? Now, if you may just look at the next one. It simply means to fill to the brim. To fill to the brim. Look at this cup for a moment. I'm going to demonstrate this so you see what we are doing. So if you fill something to the brim, you are literally doing this. It overflows. You have no room of anything else except the substance that is filled it. You get that? It's overflowing with what I'm doing here. I'm going to pardon myself with wetting the carpet. I'm doing it so that we can buy a new one. It's a bit intentional, isn't it? I'm a bit crafty. If you don't do that, you won't buy a new carpet. So you have to find a way to do it so that they can bring a new carpet in. Otherwise, Eric won't release the money. <laughs> so, to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be filled to the brim, full, that there is no room for anything else. Is to be full to the top, as I've demonstrated here with my cap, lacking nothing. Now, when you see what I've demonstrated here, you're going to see the importance of this. This glass is passive. This glass is not doing anything. I am the one who is doing the work. I am the one who is filling this glass with water. That is the idea we have here. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. The word there is passive, it's not active. God is the one filling with the Holy Spirit. Just bear that in mind as we unlock the text very quickly. I'm just going to give a snapshot of what we're going to do in the evening where we're going to have more detail to look at this. It deals with the idea of fullness. The cup is full of water. That's why we say that, don't we? The cup is full of tea. Or the cup, if you like, is full of coffee. The coffee drinkers. So the idea is this. If you have your Bible, turn with me so that I demonstrate where the word is used. John 12 and verse 3. John 12 and verse 3. Jesus is anointed with perfume. John 12. Very familiar verse. Let's read from verse 1 to 3. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who was or who had been raised from the dead, lives. Verse 2. There they made him supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. And this is an important verse 3 now. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil 
or spinard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled. That's the word we're looking for. Filled with the fragrance of the oil. Filled. People were able to smell it. The perfume. Filled the place. Nothing was left out in that room. Everything smelled of spinard. The perfume that Mary poured on Jesus' feet. That's the idea. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Completely taken over by the Holy Spirit. No room of me or I myself. Completely dominated by the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. The teachings, church, about the Holy Spirit, they are not meant just to be read and walk away after you've done that. They are not like baptism in water. Where you read it and walk away from it. No, 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 no. The teaching on the Holy Spirit is simply this. When you read it, you have to believe it. You have to experience it. You have to have it. You have to feel it. You have to know it. And you have to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what God wants you and me to experience. Be filled. Completely taken over by the Spirit of God. Look with me, if you may, another verse that talks about the same thing. Acts, where we read in the first beginning, Acts chapter 2. And verse 2. <coughs> Acts chapter 2 and verse 2. Same word being used here. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of the rushing mighty wind, and it filled. The whole house where they were sitting. The Holy Spirit came and filled the whole house. You can't use the word whole house if it's not taking control of the whole place. Does it make sense? The whole house is filled with the Holy Spirit. If you look at the verse in Ephesians chapter 2, chapter 5, sorry. If you turn there with me again, Ephesians chapter 5. It gives us a contrast between two things. So this idea of being controlled and dominated by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must have you, must have me. It must have you. Why? Why should the Holy Spirit have you? It's because Jesus bought us with a price. He bought us with a price. So that he is presented us to the Father. This is what you sent me to do. I have redeemed these people. And the Father promised Jesus the Holy Spirit who will come and fill these people. So we don't just celebrate Easter. Oh, the crucifixion that just died for my sins. And we stop there as Christians. 
we have to celebrate that he went to heaven as well. And also celebrate that the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost. They are equally important events in the Christian calendar. If you look with me, you see the, the difference here in comparison as we look at why be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18. Now it compares with don't be drunk with wine. Now, I'm sure there are some of you who are very good at tasting wines. You know, you know the difference between dry wine and sweet wine. And, you know, have you seen those guys who are wine testers, the way they do, they just put a little sip and they can tell what type of wine it is. Don't be drunk with wine. You, we know when people are drunk, we, we can see them, can't we? You can tell if somebody's drunk. Can't you? I can. The first thing when people are drunk, they can't even stand up properly and put their two legs together. That's the first thing. The movement goes, and they stagger around as they walk, and they think they're walking straight. In their mind, they think they're walking straight, but we can see, no, you're not. And they start talking a lot, don't they? When they're drunk. Even the things they're not supposed to say, they come out. So if you want someone to tell you the secret, just buy them wine. Just buy them wine, and a very good wine, the one which is sweet. So that they can keep on drinking it without realizing they're going to be drunk. And before you know it, you're going to just see they start smiling. And they start divulging a lot of stuff. And just record it. So I say, we, it's, it's, a, it's evidence for the following morning. Because they will deny it. One thing. They say a lot, haven't they? When they're drunk. The second thing, have you seen people are drunk, what they do? For whatever reason, a drunk person thinks he's the best dancer in the world. <laughs> Seeing them when they're dancing, they feel in their head that they're the best dancers. And they will let loose. They'll be dancing, they'll let go. <laughs> Don't be drunk with wine. It's the idea of wine taking control of a person. And you can see the effects of that wine or that person in their movement, in their talking, in their everything they are doing. Now compare that now to the Holy Spirit. He says this now. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Go to Acts with me in the same chapter we looked at. Acts, up there, uh, chapter 2. So when the Holy Spirit came down in Acts chapter 2, verse 13, what happened? What were other people saying? Other people mocking said they are full of new wine. See there the comparison which Paul picks up in Ephesians chapter 5? They're full of new wine because their behavior was as though these people were drunk. They were out of control. You see, one of the, the weaknesses we have as a church and all of us as Christians, we want to be in control of our lives, don't we? That's the thing. We want to be in control of our lives. We are scared to lose control. And that's why we don't give the Holy Spirit all the space that he needs in our lives. Because we don't want to lose control. 
But here we're being told, let go of yourself. Let the Holy Spirit dominate your life. People will know you are full of the Holy Spirit. How? As we'll see in a minute. They will know that. Because the work of God is not how clever you are by doing it. No. The work of God is not how smart you are at performing things. No. The work of God is about being anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what it's about. We don't want to let go. We don't want to lose control. And we resist and we fight the Holy Spirit every single time. Why? Then very quickly, why should we be filled with the Holy Spirit? First thing, for the saints. For the sake of the saints before you. What do you mean by that? Should come up on the screen. The saints. Shall we start with society? Put, put them all together, please. Thank you. So the saints, that's the first thing. Look with me, if you may. The verse we have, verse 19. Speaking to who? To one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what we are told. That's the first thing we know. That these people are filled with the Holy Spirit. They are speaking with one another in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs. Why do you think he talks about psalms? Why? Do we sing psalms in this church? No, we don't. We run away from that stuff. Because it's too hard. It's too demanding on us to do stuff. That's a sign we are not filled with the Holy Spirit. We ran away from hymns. We don't like that stuff. That's a sign we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. We have to do the three of them at once. The spiritual songs that we like, that make us feel good. What about the Psalms? My Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When did we sing that one? Why we should feel, be filled with the Holy Spirit is that when we're talking to one another, we are edifying one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We are talking about the things of God. We are building one another in the holy faith. That's what it's about. There's no room for selfishness. There's no room for negative opinion. There's no room for backbiting. There is no room for gossip. There is no room for malicious speeches. There's no room for anything negative against your brother or your sister. No room for that. Because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are excited about what God is doing within us. That's one thing. The second thing is the latter part here, which says this. Singing and making melody in your heart. Where does it say? In your heart. Not somebody's heart. So when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, we are told this, you are singing and making melody in your heart. You are merry about what God has done for you. You are excited about the goodness of God in your life. Every time you come to church, you are coming with a spring in your steps because God has done great things for you. And you are meeting with the people whom God has done great things for them. And as you meet together, the fire rises up because you are filled with the Holy Ghost. 
That's what it is. We have people who are dry and cold when they come to church. Dry! There's no melody in their heart to God. There's just dry bones within them. And what happens when they meet? They're all dry. Everything becomes dry and cold. Why church? How? Worshiping God. How can it be possible to be cold? How? The God who has done great things for you in which you are glad. The God who has given you life. The God who has given you his son. The God who has given you the Holy Spirit. The God who has given you health. The God who has given you your house. The God who has given you your resources. The God who has given you everything. How can worship be cold and dry? You tell me. What else do we need to thank God? Because we are confused. We don't understand this thing. The Holy Spirit. I implore you to stop listening to what other people are saying and listen to God speaking to you. I implore you not to listen to anyone but the word of God speaking to you. Because that's about you and your God at the end of the day. The third point is this. So sad. Acts 1, if you may turn with me please. Verse 8. It says this. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And what are you supposed to do? You shall be my witnesses for me, so sad where you are. That's what he does. You shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit is come upon you. <clears throat> Acts chapter 4 and verse 8. Acts chapter 4 and verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people, and elders of Israel, if this day are judged for a good deed done to the helpless man, by what means has he made him well? Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, then he bears witness to what God has done for them. Lastly, as we finish off, how can you be filled with the Holy Spirit? There were, two, there were three students. They are finished school. Walking home. One of the students said, oh, I'm thirsty. I need to buy myself Pepsi. So he went and bought himself Pepsi and he drank. The second student said to his friend, ah, guys, also, I feel thirsty. I want to buy myself coffee. So he went and bought himself latte coffee. And he drank and enjoyed himself. Now, one of the students was doing medical science. He said, I'm thirsty. 
And then he said to himself, I may have diabetes. What does that mean? People respond to the Holy Spirit differently. People respond to the Holy Spirit differently. Other people who just walk away and do nothing about it. Other people who question and interrogate what is being said. But what we need to do first and foremost, if you are not a Christian, the Bible is very clear. It says repent and be baptized and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The first thing, if you are not a believer this morning, is to repent, to turn around from sin. Turn, repent, turn around. Change direction in your mind, in your action. Go a different way. And when you go in a different way, God will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing. You can't have the Spirit of God if you are living in sin. You can't have the gift of the Holy Spirit if you are not a believer. You will never have that. Because we need to turn away from sin and surrender our lives to God and then he will give us the Holy Spirit. It's a gift that God gives. And lastly, to the believers, are you thirsty? That's the question. Are you happy with your life? Are you happy with the way you're serving God? Are you happy with your prayer time? Are you happy with reading the word of God? Are you happy with your witnessing for God? When did you last talk about somebody, talk about to someone about Jesus? Do you have a passion for the loss? Do you desire for Stanway to be saved? Are we thirsty for revival? Are we thirsty for the Holy Spirit to come down and move among us? I'll ask the band to come forward as we prepare to sing the last song. How much thirst do we have for God? Nothing will quench our thirst. Not the money, 